this comes up a lot in the forums and you'd expect that because a lot of data is received via emails. It could be purchase orders from customers or notifications from suppliers or contact forms from websites. So it is um, kind of difficult to do depending on the inbound email. So I'm just going to start a new flow and show you some of the ways that you can do that. Um, so I'm just going to start with um, when a new email is received. And then I'm just going to save it straight away. I'm not going to do anything with it. Show you why. I'm just going to save it because I want some data to work with. I need to put one action. I'm just going to put a compose. And then I'll do the body of the email. So I will just go over to here. And this is just a temporary form I set up in my blog to demonstrate. Um, so we'll pick a product, we'll pick Power BI and a priority. So this is for a customer that, you know, just like a support form. And we'll say, um, data refresh is not working. Please help. So if I submit that, we should have enough in our newly created flow that it will get triggered. Now, the reason that I have created that form is because I kind of know that the output it produces is not that friendly. So if I do a HTML to text conversion, and the majority of emails that you will receive will be in HTML, um, this HTML to text action is sometimes very useful, and sometimes not so useful, it needs some help. So if I have a look at this run that occurred, you can see it came in and this was the body of it. Now, when you're using this, when a new email arrives, you need to sort of uh, narrow down the parameters, otherwise it'll just execute for every email. So in this one, Power Platform Support Request, I'm going to put that into subject. The from is always going to be the same. In fact, that will be a good enough Power Platform support request. So that will get triggered now every time an email arrives. So if we go back and have a look at the run history, we'll be able to see the HTML output. And in fact, let's just resubmit it because we've got that text uh, HTML to text action now. And so we can see that we've ended up with this output. I'll just put it into notepad so you can see it a bit easier. And so there's a lot to do with this email before we can use it as data. And this is going to be the case for really any email that you receive. We want to be able to do all the nice things that Power Automate or the Power Platform can help you to do is going to have to be transformed into a format that Power Automate understands. Ideally, it'd be nice to get all of this thing as a, as a JSON string. Um, there's also no delimiters here, so we can't really tell when things begin or end. We could use these name, email. If we go and have a look at the HTML output, we will do a plain text one as well if we get time, but I wanted to show the complications associated with HTML email receipt. So if I just paste that into here, then it would give us a better idea of what it really looks like. Just reformat it to HTML. So it's quite complicated because there's a whole HTML document and styling and all sorts of stuff in the document none of which we're really interested in. We're, we're looking to get down to some of our actual data. And here you can see there's my name within this section here. So it's inside a table, which is inside a T body, and then another table. So I'm just going to sort of pick something and use that to split the output. Now I can see that each one of these elements 
is within a T body. So I'm just going to experiment back in Power Automate. And you'll sort of have to go through this process a few times to find what works. So I'm just going to do a compose. And I'm going to say split. I'm going to take my body and split it on this T body. This is going to produce an array. of elements from that HTML. So I don't need this anymore because it was no good and this HTML to text wasn't really very friendly. We could have used that, but let's see what else we can get. So we'll just use the same trigger that we used a few minutes ago. We don't need to send the email again because the data hasn't changed. So you can see now we have got an array of values most of which probably don't contain anything that's useful to us. So if we go and have a look now, here's our array, and if we scroll along, here we can see we've got one, two, three, four, five values that we actually are interested in. So nothing from, arrays all start zero. So this is zero here, one, two, three, and then we get down to this one. Now, if I look, you need to find some sort of hook. I could just start the array at three. But I can see all the ones that we're interested in contain this color value, at, which doesn't exist in the others. So I'm just going to do a filter. It's really common, this filter array operation in all kinds of things in um, Power Automate. I'm going to say filter. And the array that I'm going to filter is this split HTML body. And I'm just going to say item, so the current item. And I'll say it contains, oops. This color. So hopefully that array then should just be the bits that we're interested in. Let's have a look. We've got our array now, which is now down to five rows. Each of those rows is one of our fields from that form that we filled out. So we're sort of getting closer to the value. So we could try now doing that um, HTML to text action again. I sort of know it's st it still won't work, but we can sort of help it along a little bit. So if we do HTML to text, then we we'll use the outputs of our filter array. Um, just got to rename that quickly. I'm going to spe specify which element of the array that I'm interested in. So I'm going to say array element zero. Because array element zero on here is this name field. So let's just test it. That was no good. Now why that isn't appearing in the uh, dynamic content, just save it. Go back and edit it. And then we will do, still compose here. And then I'll do filter and then you can sort of cheat here. Say so body filter, that was why outputs wasn't the right thing. If I delete that, I can just use the code that was generated for me. C body filter zero. So this is still probably going to contain that name value. We'll see. Now we need to select a previous run. Now 
So this is now our, we're now down to just this element. We have a look at this here. We want to get to just my name. So we don't want the, the name part. Yeah, so we need, we can split it again. Let's just take that code, put it in a HTML to text action. See what we get. And once we've done this for one, we should just be able to replicate this code and it will work for all of the other fields. Yeah, so we've got name for Murano there. Um, and then what we could just do is uh, call this our name. And we'll do a compose step here. We could do this all in one step, but so we're going to do um, substring. Outputs of Par's name. And we'll begin at position four, and that should just give us our name. Oh, I always do that since the interface changed. Yeah, so now we're down to just our name. We don't need that anymore. Um, and then this one, we can just copy, paste it here. And our next field value was email. I'll just rename this to parse email. We could do this also with string manipulation, but this HTML action makes it a little bit easier. But this time, we just pick the first element from the array because this element zero here, and this is element one. The numbering on this notepad document starts at one, so we're always one behind. So if we update that, we can copy this, paste this down here. I think I copied that there, and we'll call this one email. Um, we do need to change this substring because, uh, in fact, we'll just type this one in manually. It's just as easy. If we just test it, we'll see what we get. So our email value is correct, apart from we've got this email part here. So again, we can just type email um, compose action. And the expression will be substring. Substring takes three parameters. The first one is the thing that you're going to manipulate. The second one is what character do you want to begin at? And the third one is the length, but the third is optional. So if you just leave it out, it will just go to the end of the string. So we've kind of got a way now of getting these values out, which isn't too difficult. Um, we can just go ahead and do the other ones now. Let's rename this to email. Copy this step again. Come down here and paste it in. That value was product. Now. Some of these are going to go wrong, and this is one of them, and I'll show you why. <clears throat> um, let's see. Let's see where we're up to. So the emails come through OK, the names come through correctly, but the product, which I didn't change, so let's go back here. We're now selecting the 
third element from our array. You'll see why it doesn't quite work properly. Inside of the HTML on this product, that it includes an image source. Oh, I picked the wrong one. We picked out priority here. I must have put in the wrong value. This is this. Never seems to update properly sometimes. I'm just going to have to get rid of it completely. See, just want to check the outputs here. Sometimes when using this editor, you press update and nothing happens. So sometimes you're better off just eating it and typing it in again. Put your mouse over just to test that it's OK. Then we'll just test again to see what we get. Now, so we're not getting what I expected on this third element, zero, one, two. All right, let's try that again. Okay. So we got the right element that we were looking for, but we had this product word like we had on the other ones, but we also had this image that came through with it, this Power BI logo. And so what we're really interested in is this Power BI part. If we look at this here, we can see we could use split again, but we've used split a lot. Um, so we can we know that the value we want is after this um, close square bracket. So if I modify this, um, it's not going to give me the expression. I'm going to write it out over here. You can probably see it slightly better here anyway. We were two, so I'm going to say index of look for a close square bracket. And that's going to return us the number, the position of that square bracket within that string. So here I'm going to say substring. I'm going to use that same string as the input. element and my starting position is going to be where this square bracket begins. Now so you can see <clears throat> there's all sorts of complications that come up parsing emails which you wouldn't necessarily expect um, and I have done that in the wrong position so that should have been uh, Still there. And then here we'll have a compose. That would be the outputs expression of that. I'm just going to rename this. So we've got the HTML there. Let's just peek the code of that. Here and we'll say substring that index of that should be about right. Let's see. So that should get us the product name only. Let's go ahead and get the 
final value, which is the description, um, which is array element four. Uh, I'm not even going to try and copy that again because it caused so many hassles last time. HTML. And then it's going to be. Filter. And it's array element four. Just start with that there. Got wrong action here. We'll say convert HTML to text. That. Now, you would have thought this sort of email would be easy, but because there's no repeating content, but it's just slightly difficult to select the fields. So let's just see what we look like now. So our Power BI kind of worked, but we still had this square bracket here. It's fine, we can sort that out. And our HTML to text, this part is always gonna be the same, so we might use a slightly different method here. I'm just trying to show you all the different ways that you can get that. So let's sort out this product first. So this happened because our substring began where that square bracket occurred on this index of. But we want to go one character further. So we'll say add and say comma one. long one character further. Then for our let's rename this one. Description. Do a compose here. And that will be And so I don't know what character it was. I'll have a look in a minute. Short description of your product. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Own and here's thirteen. Let's see. You'll find that you use this substring and split a lot. Let's see if our Power BI value is correct now. So our product is now Power BI. And our description, yeah, we got that right first time, so data refresh is not working. So this is okay, we can do something with this now, apart from we've got a lot of compose actions, which is kind of okay. But we could put these all into one action. I'll show that to you in a second. Let's just um, now. We can say create item because <clears throat> this is now effectively data. And we are going to go there. Customer support requests. Title, we can just use the output of our <clears throat> of our things up here. So we should have a compose called name. And I might put in an expression here as well, just to make it unique. name is going to be name and there we 
email, I'll put that in description there. And product value, we have to enter a custom value. Now you'll see here we're going to have on the next step, we're going to have a problem and I'll show you what that is. Um, product value, I think we should have product here somewhere. Product and then our priority, which is the final one. Email product. Well, maybe I didn't do priority yet. No, I left it out. Okay, let's leave priority for a second and just save it. We'll go back and fix that in a second. So if we test this, we should get in our list over here, once that's completed, a new customer support request based on the input from that email. If we edit that now, we could now <clears throat> assign it to somebody in the team and just save it. So from this point, you can kind of do whatever you want to do with it in Power Automate. What I don't like about this um, flow here is that all these compose actions make it very difficult to find what you were looking for. I got the product description, but let's just get the priority as well. Just email to text. And then the input is going to be. I'm just going to copy this. Because that priority field is going to cause us a problem, and I wanted to show that to you. Uh, so our priority is 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's just see how that looks. Also, we're going to get two items in the SharePoint list now, but we can delete that. Last priority. So we've got priority high. So we'll just take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters away from that. Upstream, that's priority. I think I tried it. Funny, when I built this when I was testing it, it was way slicker than this. I sort of forgot how to use Power Automate as a result of demoing it. So here we can see we've got priority. So we could come down here now, edit this, and put in the priority value. And then I'm going to add in a condition. And then I'm going to say if um, priority there is equal to urgent then I'll post a message to team to the channel and then I'll send it to the support team
add a link to the item. Mm, it's just that bit. Link to the item there. So now when an urgent request comes in, it will send a message as the flow bot to notify the support team to get on and look at it quickly. So let's test it and then we'll test an urgent receipt from the, we'll do another submission to see how it turns out. So the this yes branch didn't get executed and our priority was set to high, so that's correct. I'm going to clean this flow up, but let's just make it functional first. So if I do another um, support request and I'll say urgent system down, uh, flow is not sending out invoices. So this will come in in a moment and it will execute this flow again. But our condition it's probably not going to work. In fact, I know it isn't. Let's just go and have a look at the run history. Hopefully, there we go, three seconds ago. Now, of course, I've got control over this form, but generally speaking, you might not have that luxury on your inbound emails. So our priority came in as urgent system down. But this didn't match because I, I set the condition to equals. So we can either do a condition to correct the output, or we can just say contains urgent. If I save that now, and retest. And you could do all sorts of things now because you could email the customer back that submitted it to say, thanks for your submission, your support ID is in the ID from the, from the SharePoint list. You can see that was then true. And then the flow bot should have sent a uh, message here. Yeah, to this item. And there we go. Flow is not sending out our invoices. So that's come all the way through now. But our flow is still a bit of a mess. We've got all these HTML actions and all these composes. And we don't really need to have all of these. If we move these HTML actions up. So you've got our name, email, product, product description, problem description, and the priority. If I just add a single compose here, and I can write a little bit of JSON. So I'll say name, email, basis of a JSON here. We can just copy these expressions that we've written, come down to here, put them in, make sure that our mouse pointer is still in there, get the email one, put that in there. And after we've done this, go to product description, we can add in a parse JSON step and then use the output of this as dynamic content. Go to priority. So let's test this again now. Right, I'm just going to add a terminate action here while we're testing. So it doesn't go and create another record. I press the wrong thing again. Let's just resubmit this. So our email data now is 
full of the data we need. Power Automate one's a bit strange. There's a carriage return in there, but it's the same data we have from all of these separate composers into one. So if I take that output there, add an action. You don't need this pass JSON step. You can reference anything in there without it, but let's do it. So we've, I just pasted in, in the schema, it did generate from sample and put in that output that came from our compose here, which means we no longer need this, this, we can get rid of that. We can get rid of everything up to email data. Of course, our create item action won't work because it was referring to those. So it might complain when we try and save it. We got away with it. Let's see now if that still looks good. Yeah, so that executed successfully. If we get rid of this terminate action now, we go back to our create item. Now we can just click the name from the past JSON, email, description, product. This was supposed to be a choice column actually. Product and then now here you can see we're still going to have a problem with the urgent one because we don't have our custom value doesn't match the actual priority. I'll says urgent system down and the choices in the SharePoint list are only only go up to urgent. It will probably still put the value in. Let's have a look. Actually happens. Let's run now. So you can see it's taken urgent system down. If we edit it, the priority is now not filled, whereas on the others, they are. So we're going to have to modify that priority action so that it does correctly come through. Let's go back to our, so we're just sort of refining it. So if we look at our email data, here's our priority, which is this value here. This is our priority there. So I'm going to say if, Urgent system down, I think it I think is what it said. So go and have a look at the run history. Yeah, it needs to be exact. So if this substring equals urgent system down, then I want it to equal urgent instead, because that's what it says in our SharePoint list. Else, just keep the same value that you had before. That looks better. Let's try that. If we edit that. So our priority goes. Instead, we put in that expression. Let's test it again, and hopefully we should just get urgent as our priority now. And if it's not urgent, it's just going to leave it alone. Yeah, so that will now match, and in the SharePoint list, it will create a valid entry. And that will then notify the team to say, get on and have a look at it, assign it to a, someone that can look at the problem. And that's that email all passed. Now, 
this email was easy in the respect that it was not a lot of data. And it was quite tricky in the respect of how the HTML was put together. Um, I'm just going to show you with another um, email here. We'll just do another. We haven't got a lot of time, so you have to be quick. If we look at this email here, which is an email this supplier sends out, it's very easy because it's all plain text. Um, but we've got some repeating data. So we've probably got just enough time to grab this repeating data um, and see if we can do something useful with it. So instead of using a trigger, I am just going to come back over here and create a new flow. Uh, Just to save time, I'm just going to do a compose. I'm just going to paste in that email content. Now, what we can see about that email is that it is split into distinct sections with these um, minor signs that are, that are in there. So we should just be able to get straight to our order details section. If we do another compose, it's of our email content on the basis of those dashes, we should end up with quite a nice array of chunks of the email that, that contain the data we want. So I'll call this bit email section. So let's just see what we get. We should have a part with our repeating data in it. And the repeating data is actually quite tricky on, um, on HTML emails, but you can use the same technique that we just showed. So here we can see our power cables this is the actual section here that had our order data in it. So that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, fourth in the array. Let's just see what that looks like. We have the outputs from email sections, repeat the code. See how that looks. Okay, so we've got a reasonable stab at our, our order details there, but now we just need to narrow it down to only these pieces. So Let's just have a think about how we're going to do that. First of all, I'm going to filter it. And the array to filter is going to be order data, expression, item. I'm going to use the length here. So I'm going to say length item. It's going to tell us how long each. No, that isn't going to work. This needs to be split first. So I'm going to create a compose. I'm going to just press reply. I'm going to call this line feed. And then I'll make, I'll call this expression. So I say split. It's going to be the order data. And then we're going to split it on a line feed. We'll leave that. No. We've got all the lines there. Then we'll do a filter. So this is going to become an array. And we'll say the length item 
is greater than zero. So let's just have a look now to see what we've got in terms of our repeating data. So we've got a few blank lines before they've all gone. And our output is now down to close to what we want. We've still got all of these bits here because our repeating data is just this three rows. Now it's easy to see in this case that these are quite short. So we might as well just say if the length, we'll change our filter to say if the length is more than say 20, then we'll keep it. So if we say length is greater than 20, I think 25 actually, just guessing really, then we should get down to just our repeating data. Yeah, so now we've got my repeating data, but it isn't, um, still isn't really in a usable state, but again, this could be tidied up a bit, but we haven't really got time for that. So I'll do an apply to each now, and I'll do it on the basis of this new array, which we've created called lines. I've got compose in here. What I'm going to put in here is item, just so we can see what we're working with. Save that. This should give us three loops of our apply to each action. Um, and we need to split that order line up. So there's our first iteration, second iteration, and third. We look at this in Notepad. We can probably see some way that we can split that string up. We can't really use a substring function because if this was 666 lines, it's along a bit. So we can use this X to split it. And on this side, we can use this at symbol. So Let's split with the X first, over to here. And we'll say, it doesn't matter if the rest of the line contains the X as well. It kind of does actually, because it will split there as well. Um, so we'll split it on X and a space. So split item on space. And then we'll just take the zero element of that. So this should come out as quantity. Do I still want to have compose in here? Let's just have a quick look. And that should be our quantity value. And we can use that same um, expression to get us the next part. We've got our quantity, six, one. Yeah, so that's worked, that matched our email. So now if we want to get the next part of that, this one meter IEC all the way up to here, we can take the first element from here. So if we copy to my clipboard and paste this, we'll call this. Now we can take the first element because this is what is coming after that X. And we'll do it up until this at sign. So let's just, this should give us everything. Let's just see what we get. We don't need another split. We can just use a substring now because that at is always delimits the end of the line. So we've got our string now but we need this at symbol gone and we need to get the price on its own so if we edit this we, here's our split expression notepad so that's our value so we are going to do substring our value 
and we're going to start at position zero and then our ending location is going to be index of this is the thing that we're going to search and we're going to look for an ascending so that should give us I haven't checked the chat actually, and I've just seen a few questions, so I'll go and have a look at that in a second. That should now give us our item as well. Oh no. I have a mistake in that expression. Just correct that. And then for the quantity, I'm just going to borrow that split expression. I'm just going to split it on an at symbol and take the first element, not the first. So we've got our item now, we've got the quantity. We just need to get the final value, which is the price. So I'll do a compose. So we're going to split the item based on at symbol. That will split it two ways. It'll be everything before, which would be the zero element, and everything after will be the one element. So we'll look at that. And then while we're here, I'm just going to quickly do a compose. Take that expression. Put in there, just like we did before in the previous one. Take this substring put in here. Take the price. Not that I know if the price works yet because I haven't tested it, but I think it will. Let's just save that. Okay, so that looks like it maybe worked. Yeah, that needs to have a trim on it as well. This one, I'm going to put that there because I don't really care about that one above now. I'm going to delete it. Now, this is a handy little trick. So each one of these is going to output this JSON. I'm going to get rid of these now. We don't need them anymore, but they were good to help us build these, this JSON expression up. I'm going to add an action here. It's going to be a compose, and it's just going to be the output in fact, I'm just going to rename this uh, from JSON. I'm going to take the output of line JSON there and just peek the code. Then delete it again. I'm going to add a new step outside the loop, which would be a compose with exactly the same. Line array. We save this now and something a bit curious happens in the apply to each and I'll explain that. So our apply to each now should contain more or less our repeating data. Each one will contain the quantity, the item and the price. And the output of this line JSON, the output of the apply to each will come out into an array. So if we look at this line array here, we can see that it's turned our output into an array. So we've got each of the elements from this applied to each loop in a single array, which we can then iterate through and 
do whatever we want. We put this data into our account system along with the other order details that we could get from. So you can compile a single JSON that's got all of the order data plus the lines in it. Um, I'm just going to have a look at uh, chat on here to see if anyone's got any questions. Is fit quantify X otherwise go park at least space. Yeah, well, we can trim that. Um, we trimmed the output of the quantity so that it's uh, can be turned into a number quite easily. Um, are there any questions that other than that? Because we've covered quite a lot and there's only four minutes left. So uh, if anybody would like to know anything about what happened in those flows, please uh, ask the question. Hand handle it if the email body is not static. Well, I mean, this question comes up a lot and it's tricky because if the email content changes all the time, then it becomes extremely difficult to write a parser that can handle it. Um, it can be done, but you have to look for very specific values. Um, and so if you've got something like name colon, you could do an index of to find the name and then just grab the part after it until the next space or something along those lines. But if the email changes a lot each time, then you know it could be error prone. So you're going to have to put in a lot of error checking or you could it could crash quite easily. So ideally you want the um, incoming email to be as similar to, to follow a, a designated format. Um, so our form that we use to, to build this incoming email, the, the content changes, but it changes in a way where we can predict it. If it's just a completely different email, then uh, then you're going to get a bit stuck. Well, it looks like that is all the questions. I hope it was useful. I think you'll be Hi there, Paul. Definitely was useful. Um, in fact, it is a very, very um, common scenario where clients need to be able to extract uh, email content for various reasons, as you mentioned earlier. I know that one of them is also required for data migrations as well. Uh, where they need to keep historical emails loaded from one system to another. I know maybe flow might not be the best approach for data migration, but for ongoing requirements like yours, then then yes. Um, I see some comments saying using Azure Cognitive Services. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if you can show an example of using Azure Cognitive Services, then, then that's great. Um, I know that Paul showed us how to do it using Power Automate, and, and uh, I think... Personally, I feel that this um, example you've shown us today, Paul, it's it really just shows someone how to really use Power Automate as a tool more than anything, you know, overcoming limitations and, and showing its and flexing its muscles. So that's what I really get from fr from your session today is really being able to use all the features and 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 functions uh, effectively to achieve your goals. So uh, as a citizen developer, so. Uh, thanks again, Paul. Uh, very, very good session, actually. Um, it really does give really good insight into using Power Automate effectively uh, for your development tasks. Uh, uh, you know, many d developers will typically use uh, like some sort of .NET library to to perform these actions. But for those who do not know .NET, um, this is the way to do it. And Paul has shown you how to do it. So. Uh, again, Paul, um, do you have any final words for the community on how to keep in contact with you? Um, you can um, come to my blog and that's got um, tachytelic.net. There's a contact form there um, which you can just use to get in touch with me. But probably the easiest way is that I'm always on the Power Automate community forums. Um, go to that and if I'm available, I'll pick up any questions that you've got. I'm a recently, um, recently became a super user on there. So, um, you know, keen to keep up that status. So I, I pick up questions quite frequently. Um, so yeah, catch me there is probably the best place. Thank you once again, Paul. Um, so Paul, uh, Power Community,